been on the road since, you know, just after breakfast in the morning. And I'm driving and I look, you know, and I see there's a, I couldn't really tell what it was, but covered by white linen under a tree. And we stop, this is the father now, and he says, no, um, that's a body. He let us into that moment of exactly what happened to his six-year-old son, telling us that um, the house had collapsed while he was at work. He was working a night shift. And we asked his father, like, how long have you been standing here? Um, and I think it had been over two hours waiting. And a police officer was driving a private vehicle, and he came and they were putting bodies at the back of this bucky. But when he got there, they were already other bodies. I'm just like, brace yourself because if you think this is bad, then we're not even ready. Everything is gone. Fridge, cupboard, dish, everything is gone. Put the damage with water so we can't even eat it. We're going to be river right. right. Okay. Right. The wall behind our house, the whole thing fell down. That's how they died. I was in KZN for the KZN Regional Conference, the ANC Regional Conference in Itekwini. And when I landed, it was already raining, actually. And the rain never, never stopped. But I didn't think anything of it, you know. Um, it was also raining here in GP, so they didn't think it was going to become what it became. It's starting to fill the building and go into the basement. When we were leaving Peter Mary's work, people were going on with their lives. You wouldn't think that there was so much devastation. I didn't know what was happening coming into this, so I'm sure people don't realize how bad this is. Got containers absolutely blocking the road. Everything is closed up, everything's come to a standstill. Trucks in the water. This is the going to the farmer's market. There's mud all over the road, you know, and people are trying to shove it off so that the cars can pass through. And I can see that there are people walking, like they're carrying their belongings up to the top of like the main road where we are. And that's when we started asking them, hey, what's going on down there? 
and they were saying look we're just trying to get out of here because you can see we won't be able to get out we're taking what is closest to us and we're going to walk up to the main road and and try and get somewhere else before it kills us the only way to kind of get it across was to put myself on on camera and and tweet it so we're in a place called Kwan Dengezi. It's not far from Pai Town. Um, and I've just spoken to a young man. And um, I don't really think it Nigeria caught traction until we got to that father. His desperation and his reality became a lot of South Africans' reality. After having conversations with that dad, you know, it became clear to me that he had already been stripped away of so much of his own dignity. I remember him um, opening the, the linen just staring at his son you know he constantly tried to make sure while lying on those other bodies that he was comfortable I cannot imagine It was the strangest drive back to Durban because it took about two and a half hours, maybe more. Um, I had to have my radio off, my hazards on, and I don't think I passed 80 k's an hour the entire time. The destruction has been completely unprecedented. If you look at a road like Ntuzuma Access, a main point for a large part of that sort of Durban community has been completely destroyed. You could look down seven meters at least down that into that embankment. That's a piece of road that just washed away. Mother's temple has been completely destroyed, together with other deities outside the temple. Our entrance gate has been completely destroyed, together with our hall. It's very heartbreaking, disheartening of what happened to us. We're losing all our belongings, all our possessions, and the situation we are in, it's not good enough. This used to be my house. This used to be my home. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is the remaining. These are the remaining of my house now. I was up in the road at the top when I noticed that uh, flooding had started and um, I alerted my neighbour because that's the lowest point in the road and the water would go through there. The water couldn't seep through into the natural soil below. That formed a huge runoff area which cascaded through the bush and came through the properties here.
on the very first day that we arrived in Durban, it was a Thursday, and by then the skies had completely cleared, people were swimming, it was a good day for most. elderly man from Amgwangolos, he was there with his children and when we spoke to him, he spoke of how the last thing he heard his daughter, who was in her 20s, say before the walls caved in on them was, we're all going to die. He walked up to screams from um, his daughter and that was the last thing that um, he heard her say and she was swept away instantly by the floods. One of the last memories he has of her is her saying something so terribly painful and ominous and before he could even realize what was going on that's what he woke up to. The sheer scale of the bodies that were found, the kids, um, the families, you, you heard accounts of people, you know, literally trying to hold on to their loved ones and just had to let them go because you know, of the sheer force of the water. my sister and her two children and my elder sister's two children. They were on their sleep, so it was raining, pouring. And I'm feeling very sorry for my mom, you know, because she was there sleeping in the same room with my sister and she had to pull her to help her from there. Asking them, can't you help them pull, try and pull them? My mom said, no, we can't because the whole mud rocks and everything from behind. Phew, I can't explain. We believe that they're going to be angels and look upon us, you know. So we're very pleased and happy that we're going to lay them to rest and then tomorrow we're going to start a new day, but we we'll always keep them in our hearts. Search and rescue teams have been working very hard in the 14 days since the floods, retrieving dead bodies of people who went missing. The people part of these teams are so passionate about what they do. And I think I remember some of them saying they've worked flat out 14 days straight. Come down okay. eight yeah. kilometers downstream.
The first two days we were all going for the rescues and rescues and just trying to make a difference and getting people out. We've all got that, that, that urge in us and that, that hope that we still find a few people alive, but yeah, it's just mostly body recoveries. Entire homes with families inside were washed away. People near the river washed away. Um, and there are still families who haven't had the closure of receiving the body of their loved ones to bury um, after these devastating floods. And I was there working and I was exhausted and I wanted a break. And to think that they had been out there dealing with much more challenging scenarios than I was, I had enormous respect. We then moved into Tongat, and I think what shocked me most was the level of desperation and, and just the lacking of resources. Um, people are poor and they're desperate and they were old, old people carrying five liters, um, buckets of water. You just can't really imagine being in that situation. It's very difficult for water for us. We old people, we can't manage to fill, yet we got arthritis and we are pressure people, sugar people. We are sickly and I was in hospital with this virus. Like old people, it's very, very difficult for them to, you know, carry right from there and breathe it warm. I think that there was a very slow response from government, in my opinion. Mayor Nkulisi Kaunda, he was sort of out and about in Mpola, in the Marion Ridge area, and there was a leaking pipe that they knew about. There was a delay, there was about a two hour delay to even get there. There was a delay to, to have the mayor come there. When he came there, there was a lot of grandstanding about, yes, we knew about this pipe. We identify this challenge. The team is coming to fix it. It's a matter of agents and our teams are on the way. And I was just thinking, is this the sort of responses that, we, that we're getting from government? You know about this, so you leave it for us to come here and for you to sort of say now, okay, we know about this and we're going to sort out this, this broken pipe. It was just very disingenuous, I felt. Attending a funeral People appreciate that for sure, and it is wonderful to show that support, but where are you in actually offering measurable physical assistance? Getting water to the people. I mean, politicians having municipal water delivered to their homes instead of to people who needed it more. There's so much of that in KZN that it's infuriating. The situation is bad. We, we don't, we, actually, we, we're not surviving in a good way, like we used before. Like, uh, I can say uh, the situation right now, uh, we need help. I know I shouldn't be in love, but it's so hard to move on. You haven't changed, you stayed the same. But if you did, I'd still love you anyway. I think the first reaction when we would ask questions about what do you want government to do or how can government assist you, they tell you like, what do you, what do you want me to say to you? Um, they're going to come, they're going to bring food packages, they're going to bring blankets, they're going to bring the cameras, they're going to bring us, the media, and we're never going to see them again. I 
point I felt like I felt a little bit helpless because there's not really much you can do for them. Um, I think that hurt me a lot. Three of them I can bear listening to. You've got to find a way to keep moving forward because you've got to tell these stories because there are people that are in a far worse position than you that have no voice. It was very important for me to use my voice in whatever way I could and people can realize how important it is for governments to give people dignity and build them proper infrastructure and build them proper stormwater drainage systems so that people don't have to go through things like this. I'm grateful to be able to do this work um, and to be able to sit here and still tell people you know about it. This, this event has now gone down as one of the deadliest natural disasters in South Africa. Smile.